You're listening to The Science of CX. My name is Steve Pappas. I'm known for my relentless pursuit of all things customer. Across my career and also in my six startups, I've had to learn how to make decisions in business that customers really respond to. Let's spend some time together and help your business soar, grow, and accelerate. Once again, thanks for joining us on this episode of The Science of CX. And we do have Angela Simpson with us again as my co-host. Today's going to be interesting. We're going to be talking a little bit about restaurants and the curbside takeout experience. But let's first talk about masks. (laughs) Angela, what have you been encountering with masks out there? I've been doing the majority of the grocery shopping and then going back and forth into areas that require masking. My husband had to put on a mask for the first time the other day. He wasn't in it two minutes. He, this is hot. <laughs> like, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, you know, I'm carrying a mask always in the back of my my pants, uh, in my back pocket, uh, just because some places require it, some places don't require it. And we find ourselves looking for the sign on the door of every place we have to go in, whether it's a convenience store, it's to go in to pay for your gas or to uh, go in and get uh, coffee at, you know, the local uh, uh, gas station or whatever it is. You're looking for the sign. I I find myself staring to see, is there a sign that says we need a mask or does it just say that? We've changed our hours, we've limited our hours, and all of our employees have to wear masks. So it runs the gambit. I don't know what you're finding out there if you have to, you know, go to any of these things. Well, and see, I've gone the other direction. You're you're walking up to every door checking for the sign. I've just put the mask on in my car, you know, check my hair to make sure it looks good with the mask, and then I'm just going on in. <laughs> It's, you know, the poor teenager having to sit at the door as you're walking in and is supposed to be the person to make sure you're wearing a mask. Now, for the people who don't want to wear one, I'm not sure a a 16 year old is really going to sway them to go out back out and get that mask on. Well, uh, I I think the uh, the whole idea that buffets will probably be a thing of the past. I mean, I was noticing Soup Plantation and Sweet Tomatoes, they're closing down 97 of their locations. Um, If you think about it, they're, you know, they make all their profit based on being a efficient and effective buffet because you you can run with low labor. So to see that some of them are going into bankruptcy and they're they're already cutting down on the number of locations. I, you know, I, I have I have a feeling we're we're starting to just see the beginning of the effects of this when it comes to business. And then what happens to the employees? I mean, they're they're gonna be a lot more out out of work too. Yeah, and that's really scary. I mean, you know, the number of people who have made their livelihood out of working at the restaurants. And as much as people have enjoyed going to the restaurants, now to figure out what the new economy is going to be like with uh, how much longer will we be doing curbside and and drive throughs even after it's open, because people aren't going to want to wait in the incredibly long lines for reduced table seating. How many wait staff are not going to have a job to go back to because there are fewer stations for them to wait on? Yeah. Yeah. Because I I guess there'll be people that like myself, I'm noticing myself, I'm being, you know, much more generous on my gratuities uh, because I'm thanking the wait staff or I'm thanking the, the people that are providing me the food or delivering our food. But, you know, at some point, I would say most consumers are going to start going back to the normal tipping and gratuities. And if that's the case, to your point, if wait staff had normally had 10 stations and now they've got four or five, how are they going to make money? You know, uh, will the businesses change from the two dollars and something an hour and and have them make the majority of their 
their income on tips? Will they switch to a high per hour minimum or above? Well, can the restaurant owners afford to do that when they too aren't getting as many tables turning over and they're not getting as much income? Yeah. What restaurants are going to make it? What types of restaurants will make it? It's, uh, you know, the ones that have to, that run very efficiently, um, in a drive through takeout kind of scenario may, but sit down. I mean, is, is a sit down, sit down restaurant going to be a thing of the past? We, uh, use the curbside service from one of our favorite fine dining restaurants this week. Um, you know, we missed them terribly and was really wanting their food. And actually, I was very surprised at how they managed to make almost a fine curbside experience. You know, when I called in, you got a little bit more conversation, offering up some of the additional. This happened to be a, a Japanese restaurant. So, you know, a little conversation behind, you know, do you need any soy sauce or wasabi? Would you like some chopsticks? How many will be dining this evening? Just a little bit to try and make you feel like you weren't just ordering at a drive through And then even when they walked out to bring me my food, just that extra 15 seconds of personal interaction that they were doing to try and really up the experience when you have much, um, much less time to interact with your consumer. You know, what could they do to make me appreciate that I had paid a little bit more for my curbside meal? Yeah, I think you bring up you bring it up a good point, um, because maybe you know, as we look at CX, you know, the general customer experience, we've all always looked at it from a particular lens. But it seems like the CX, the the newly emerging normal CX, is going to be separated um, by the types of things that you're doing. So, like you said, there's a curbside CX, there's a takeout CX. There's a drive-through CX, right? There's what what types of what types of things can a owner of a business or the manager um, put into place to make that experience better? Because they, they still are dependent upon you coming back, right? They're still dependent upon the repeat business, uh, not the first time and only one time business, right? So so they've got to somehow figure out. How do they make the experience better when now they don't have you for an hour, when they don't have you for an hour and a half with, you know, to another couple, let's say Um, that that's a different, much different experience when you're doing something online, you're picking up the phone, you're driving up to a curb and someone is handing you a bag, right? So what, what are the. What are the different things that they could start thinking about to deliver the overall better restaurant customer experience while the world is changing around them? Are they thinking about it? I think they're I think they're starting to get into that mode where they have to think about it, but I don't know necessarily if they know where to start, right? So so what are the things that that you could think about, like you just had an exa- a good example, you know, did it start from when you picked up the phone and you had the conversation? And then how was the customer experience through pickup and beyond when you checked the bag? Did you have everything in it? Right. Like that. I mean, take, take me through that experience if you could. That's the, the let's, t- let's call this the curbside customer experience. Well, I think the first thing was the, the phone call itself how that how quickly they answered the phone, how they interacted with me during that conversation, the different things that I was offered. Uh, just for me, even the phrase, obviously, it stuck in my mind, how many will be dining this evening? Mm. You don't really think about something that simple, but it made an impact on me. The way he phrased that I was still going to be dining, not just what do you want to eat tonight? Mm. How was the greeting? Was the greeting really cordial, like like when you walk into the restaurant? I heard the smile in his voice. There you go. Okay. 
he sounded he sounded grateful that I was calling mm. without being desperate. Interesting. Interesting. That's a that's a good point. And you know, okay, so even things like I, I said I wanted to be able to pick up at five o'clock. Do you think you'll be very close to that five o'clock time? I want to make sure I fire your meal at the appropriate timing so that it is ready the moment you arrive. Yes, I, I think five o'clock is, is exactly when I will be able to pick it up. Perfect. Then we will begin to fire your meal at 4.35. Oh, wow. So he had exact timing that he communicated to me as to when they would begin to cook my meal so that it was ready the moment I arrived. And, you know, would you like to pay now or would you prefer to pay upon arrival? Gave me that choice. Mm. So I'd like to go ahead and pay now. Perfect. One moment. Process my credit card payment. He said, now that you've already prepaid, you have the choice if you would like us to bring it curbside or if you would prefer to come in and pick it up yourself. Leaving me that option. Mm. When I got there, they had parking spaces designated for curbside pickup, which is not normal for this restaurant because it is fine dining. It had no previous curbside or drive through opportunities. So I pull up. The sign still said that to please come in, but I knew I had already been told it's OK. I can choose to call if I want. So I called him. I said, I'm actually a few minutes early. So whenever my meal is ready, I'm here. That's perfect. We will be out the moment your meal is ready. And he actually brought it out at five minutes till five. So I knew my meal was fresh and hot, had just come out of the kitchen. Interesting. So, and everything was there? I didn't feel the need to check my bag before I left. Okay. I'm not sure I've left a drive through in the past five years without feeling the need to double check my bag. But it didn't even occur to me that I needed to do that. I was so confident that everything was there. Now, one thing we got home, I'm unpacking it. My husband was looking at the quality of the takeout containers. Mm. That impressed him. I had to drive 15 minutes to get home with that food. And the only thing that showed a little bit of um, impact from the drive were the pot stickers. That's going to get just a little chewy because it continued to steam for another 15 yeah. minutes. That's going to happen. But we knew that when we ordered it yeah. and it's what we wanted. So we were willing to put up with that. Our entrees were in perfect eating condition 15 minutes later. And I think that's something that a lot of chefs are putting thought into. I have a friend who's actually a two, three, oh, three Michelin star chef up in Chicago and talked about some of the dishes that he was removing from his curbside menu because he knew it wouldn't get home in the best condition to eat. So he was going to make sure that anything that he offered up for curbside pickup would make that transition to home dining and still be that fine dining meal. Hmm. Now, do you think they do you think there's a there was a conscious um, retraining or rethinking of all of these steps that you just talked about at this establishment? Do you think do you think that the the ownership, the management actually sat down and thought through the curbside customer experience journey? I think at this restaurant they had to because yeah. it's not something they had ever done before and they had to put that effort into figuring it out. I think one of the differences will be the restaurants who have really thought through that customer experience and the ones who have just tried to throw it together quick. Well, I think I think we're going to see yeah, we're going to see multiple camps emerge. We're going to see the ones that that think about it as a journey, right? And they think about it as an experience. And the others that feel like, well, we've had to switch over to this. We're trying to make the best of it. And then there'll be others that are just trying to somehow shoehorn their existing process into this new reality. 
And, uh, you know, who's going to win and who's going to lose? I think we're going to see very quickly um, what's going to happen. I mean, we've we've had it uh, where we've ordered from the same place. We've ordered pizza from the same place. It's a small, you know, one shop place, but they they make a great pizza, great crust, always cooked the, the right way. The toppings are always perfect. Um, three weeks ago, we had ordered from them. Um, and when I say burnt, when they arrived burnt, Ew. I would have been mortified as the owner that my quality control was that bad that we called. And I mean, this is a place we've ordered from for a long time. They know us. Um And what have you. But when we called, we felt like we did something wrong. Oh, they said to us, well, we can replace them. However, you've got to give us back the burnt ones (laughs) because they're they're anticipating the scammers. Of course, the scammers that are, well, this is a little off. I'm going to call, get another one. And and then, you know, the kids are going to eat for the next three days. Um and I really felt taken back by that because now I was lumped in with the potential bad apples that they see as a business. Um, we haven't ordered from them since. I'm not surprised. And now will we order from them again? So I'm thinking, too, that it's it's not just how they, you know, how they treat you here. But when something goes wrong, how do they recover? Right. How do they respond to a bad experience? How do they ensure the loyalty comes back? Because this will end at some point. And, you know, yes, there's going to be remnants of things for a while. And this may be on people's minds longer than other things that have happened in the past. Um, But. How are they going to recover the loyalty factor? Because right now, it wasn't the fact that it was burnt. We understand that things happen. A, I don't understand the quality control. Did not, didn't somebody actually cut it? It wasn't still cooking that much in the car on the way. But um, they should have caught it then. All right, it happens. It was the way we were treated afterwards when we called. That was that. That was the difference. That's the part that bothered us more than than anything. We could have put up with the fact that it was burnt. Okay, replace it. That's fine. But treated almost criminally, like, well, we got to take back the the bad ones. You know, they're throwing them in a dumpster. But the sheer fact that they didn't trust us <laughs> it told told us volumes. Well, didn't trust you specifically making it complicated for you to be made whole at having a good dining experience. You're going, especially when you talk about the pizza industry, at a timing where just before COVID hit, you had a major chain that was advertising pizza insurance. No matter what happens to your pizza, if it's not fantastic We'll take care of it for you, trying to make it as easy as possible. Then here you are trying to support a local pizza place and they're making it as difficult as possible. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mentor, you know, a lot of small businesses in these types of areas in the customer experience. And these guys are not someone I I mentor, but man, would I love to sit down with the owner for a little bit. I don't consider myself to be Gordon Ramsay in the restaurant business, but in the customer experience, A, there are some common sense things to be thinking about, and B, then there are the the experience to your good customers that you need to take care of. But uh, it seemed like all of it just kind of went out the window. It, now, maybe bad day. Maybe we caught them on a bad day. It was just really busy or something. But um, it was a Tuesday night. Um, I didn't notice anything. And then we've had great experiences like you guys have, right? We had a great experience for breakfast. The first day we could actually go out to a patio dining. I think that the picnic tables were about 12 feet apart, but uh, Sunday morning, uh, my wife and I went out to a 
uh, new newly opened place. And we felt kind of bad because they had planned to open sometime February or March. And, you know, here they are opening in May. And we're saying, oh, they're, they're really struggling already. And they haven't even got off the ground. So we went. It was a great experience. They they did everything right that you could think of from how they treated us, how they served us, checked on us from a distance, you know, all 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 great. But at least there was the first time we and we love going out on the weekends for breakfast one of the days anyway. And we felt like we really missed it for so long. And just to go out and have breakfast outside, it was a beautiful day and all things were great. Yeah, we'll be back. We'll be back. We're probably not ordering pizza from that place, but we'll be back to the breakfast place. Okay. (laughs) I think one thing to consider, we've touched on it a little bit, is the combination of the experience between the human interaction and then making sure your product is solid for this new delivery method. You know, bringing food curbside is very different from presenting food at the table. We had one restaurant that we went to last week and did a curbside experience that absolutely does delivery and takeout all the time. And that bag got to me and already had grease down the inside of the bag. It was Italian. And we were quickly scrambling with what we had in the car to keep from getting that grease on me, on the car. I shouldn't have to do that. That should be taken care of. Right. So, you know, whether it's food or other industries, something to think about during these times as people are experiencing all businesses in new ways. What are you doing to make sure you're offering the optimal human interaction or technical, technologically based interaction for your customers? And what are you doing to make sure your product is meeting their expectations? Because every dollar spent is going to be scrutinized just a little more because you have a lot of people who are unemployed right now. Yeah, no, uh, you're absolutely right. It's not just it's not just about about the food because they can deliver it hot right to your table. It's about so many more factors. And, and that's that's a great, great uh, point for us to uh, to end on is really it is about all of those factors is, you know, just like you said, from from the phone call, the inquiry, the, you know, knowing what kind of calls you're getting. Uh, writing down all the calls, making sure that who's ever picking up the phone has the has the um, understandable smile in their voice, which means they have it on their face. They're genuinely happy for you to be calling, um, happy that, you know, happy for your business, um, giving you the level of uh, experience in the ordering process uh, and then you know, taking it from there and making sure that the timing, the uh, the uh, quality of the food, the delivery timing of the food, the curbside experience um, and your post curbside experience, because, you know, how many times do you get something home and there's an issue? And then what happens when you call and try to remedy the issue what is your experience then? I think we're all going into um, uh, uh, changes in these various experiences, but it doesn't mean we get away from the basics of customer experience and also make sure that we're taking care of our employees because it's their experience and we want to keep our great employees for the long term, make sure that they're making money for their families and they're happy in the organization. So, I think with that, I think we are coming to another end of our Science of CX episode. Angela, once again, thanks. Always great talking to you. And I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for inviting me back, Steve. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. You've been listening to the Science of CX. My name is Steve Pappas. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode. And if you have, The highest compliment that you can give us is to subscribe, rate, and review The Science of CX. Thanks, and we'll see you in the next episode.